Welcome back to Mozzie Cells. Today we're going to be talking about the Cell GP Start. Now, this isn't something I thought I was going to really talk about because, honestly, as a bit of a traditionalist, I wasn't a big fan of the reaching starts in Cell GP or the previous America's Cup. But I'm kind of being pleasantly surprised about how they're working out in terms of the fleet racing and some of the tactics we're seeing evolve around them. So we're going to tackle that today. What makes a good start in Cell GP? And we'll also pick up on what I thought was one of the spicy little subplots of the second weekend for Cell GP. And that was the uh, starting tactics of Nathan Atteridge and the little um, kind of shutout or Pac-Man of, um, of the Spanish team and Phil Robertson. So, yeah, quite a juicy little interaction there as well, which um, I think follows on from some of the discussion around the tactics. Now, first of all, got to level up with you. I am a proper critic and I'm going to be critical here. Cell GP, I've really been enjoying the racing, but honestly, I've struggled to get my teeth stuck into it. There's just not the information up there in terms of the uh, the kind of metrics of the boats that are flying around. And my eyes lit up when I saw they were creating a new uh, Cell GP Insights kind of web page. I uh, clicked on that, had some good information on. I was like, this is fantastic. I can trawl through this post race really get my head around how the boats are being sailed and what the key kind of performance metrics are and i've gone back to it today and it's just a blank holding page again so it doesn't seem to be something that's up post race uh, that's kind of really disappointing because that's kind of like the data you don't really have the time to look through in real time it's something that i like to digest kind of after the fact um so fingers crossed that comes back on a more permanent basis i'd really like to see that and then the second thing that made it hard to really get my teeth stuck into is the the filming for the first event in bermuda like just wasn't up to season one standard now there were a few teething issues on season one but i actually found like the first races a little bit just impossible to watch especially when wanting to get some of the tactics and an idea of what was going on the start and here um, I'll jump in and show you why okay so this was Bermuda and I've got quite a lot of hate for the way they film this often it's like a chopper flying in from the first mark you can't see where the line is, where the boats are, play this forward. You've got only got four seconds to go. You can't see where any of the boats are. It's absolutely horrible. And I think, I mean, they're still doing it, trying to get this swooping shot as it camera comes towards the boats and the boats go in the other direction. But it's just impossible to follow, impossible to get an idea of how the boats have approached the key the pre-start which for me is one of the key interesting points this camera angle is the camera angle they need kind of like above to windward and yeah a decent way above the line so you can see a kind of like a plan view of how the boats approach it but it was still really late in getting to it so for me i think i don't from a minute or 45 seconds at least before the start they should have that chopper position to windward of the start line, just sighting dead down the line. You can see all the boats approaching it, and um, that's the way to go. But again, they're trying to turn these sweeping shots. Rant over, really annoying, but it kind of put me off. Put me off looking at these um, these boats in more detail. But the flip side is, I am kind of getting into the starting tactics a little bit, and that surprises me for several reasons now first of all you have to talk about traditional starts traditionally um championship sailing races start with a windward leg so against the wind and um, the start line is set roughly perpendicular to the wind and there's a whole load of really nice kind of like tactical interactions which go hand in hand with that sort of setup for a race um, so you have your line biased, 
which end of the line is closest to the wind will then put you further up wind at the start go which will get you to the woman mark quicker and um, choosing which side of the line for which way you're going to tack off and go up the beat if there's a game feature and there's also a lot of good reasons why a windward start and a windward leg is a good way to start a race i mean first of all um, going up wind is probably the most controllable point of sailing so in terms of positioning a boat controlling your speed um, everyone getting an organized start starting to windward makes a lot of sense um, secondly from a rules point of view um, it's a lot easier for everyone to just line up um, above the ley line for the pin end and below the ley line for the windward end and know you know that the angles people can sail within that those two ley lines is pretty limited because people can only luff so high until they stop and you can sail past them so it's a reasonably ordered affair and the other big thing for starting with a windward leg first especially in fleets large fleets is a windward leg's very selective so you've got a big fleet it's a way of separating that fleet um, out quickly kind of distinguishing between the better the middle and the bottom of the fleet um, and that's useful because if you're sailing in 60 70 80 you know 100 plus boat fleets then actually you kind of want some sort of separation by the time you get to the first mark otherwise it's going to be chaos so it's kind of a deliberately selective way of separating out the fleet and also a windward leg you can't go directly into the wind so everyone's going to be fanning out across the wind saying these 45 degree angles and that kind of opens up the course as wide as possible so if you do get a bad start then a windward I don't know a windward fleet race gives you the maximum opportunity to get back into a race compared to a reaching start whereas if you've got a bad start there's less tactical options there's less you can spread away from the fleet there's less kind of breadth you can find on the course for clear air so yeah the traditional in me really likes the windward legs and I could see why they would go reaching legs because kind of all those things I just said it's the opposite and some of that makes for good viewing so if it's a reaching leg there isn't really anywhere the boats they can't immediately start and spread out so you get you know at least a first reach where all the boats are in picture at once they're not taking any massive tactical variations it's just a pure boat speed race to the first mark and that is quite photogenic so you can see why they've done that it keeps the boats closer together for longer so yeah in some ways if you get a bad start there's less options to overtake on that first leg but you're not going to drop hugely far behind there's only so many mistakes you can make whilst reaching directly to a mark so these reaching starts do keep the race close and do give you kind of like a nice cinematic um opening shot to the race to kind of get the race established so i can see why they've done it but yeah the tradition in me was kind of thinking the um the windward windward starts conventional start line is the way to go so yeah kind of bit surprised that i've actually really enjoyed these reaching starts so the way i see it there are three tactics which are kind of emerging on these starts and the teams are often not necessarily bothered about which end of the line they start at although and whether basically the top of the line gives you a top of the line with a broader reach the first mark gives you better speed than the bottom of the line with a tighter reaching angle there's a little bit of play there but a i think the variabilities in shifts and variability in gusts make that very hard to predict from a sailor point of view you then have which end is closer to the next mark might even be the middle of the line which is closer to next mark and again i think these courses are pretty well set and shifts and gusts will probably negate much ex much um much gain there so what you're left is is just nailing a time and distance and b managing boats around you and i kind of see three tactics emerging on this and it kind of plays into how these first legs end up being structured as well and we can kind of see it on on this start here so the boats at the top of your screen certainly um australia and gbr have come in you can see their tracks they've come in on this lower angle 
and this angle is normally about the ley line for the windward mark. Now, this gives you kind of a lot of power because you're typically the leeward boat. That means like it's your right of way. Um, you can hold up, that's quite a controllable angle to sail to the line in terms of managing your speed. And then when you're comfortable with your time and distance, you pull the trigger by dropping your nose down and taking a full run at the line. Now, sometimes if they're a bit early, they'll end up having to sail high and end up at the windward end of the line. If they're a little bit later, they'll put the bow down earlier and end up at the leeward side of this line. But that's quite a powerful and um, uh, consistent starting strategy that we see being employed now. The downside to this is the leeward end of the line is really difficult to emerge from in terms of the race for the next mark. And this is because if you get rolled by one boat and you're at the leeward end of the line, so if Australia get rolled by GBR, um, they basically, if they head up to get better wind, they're just heading up into more and more boats' wind wake. There's then the I'll just go where there aren't other boats strategy, which is being um, perfectly displayed by Denmark, just reaching usually slightly a little bit later than everyone else come in foiling at full speed except that you're probably going to start half a boat length back on the line compared to the others but know that whatever happens you're always going to be hitting the line at pretty much full speed and you just adjust your run to aim for any large gaps on the line that'll normally have you about in the middle of the fleet you're not going to get to first mark first unless something drastically goes wrong um, but it's pretty conservative and seems to be a bit of a favorite of Denmark in terms of starting strategies you then have the windward end bandits and this is funny because actually France and Spain are two of the teams which deploy, deploy this method most of all I've already kind of touched on it like one of the great things about starting at the windward end of the line is that um you know if you mess up this start and have to drop back, you're only dropping back into one boat's wind wake. If one boat gets ahead of you or comes up on you, then you're only in one boat's dirty air and you can then just come up again higher to find clear air. So, you know, the second best start at the windward end is still a decent start because you can come up and find clear air. Um, the big risk of doing this, of course, is the shutout because you're coming in above the ley line which means you're relying on all the other boats in the fleet bearing away and starting a race this kind of brings us on to the weekend's um antics okay so on to italy and much better camera angle thank you so much it's this looking down from to windward of the start line from a minute out <clears throat> we're going to see how the boats all approaching this and um yeah this is quite an interesting start most people are starting a little bit higher not too many people starting in with the kind of like um coming up line wind on the ley line for the windward end because it's marginal foiling conditions so that's the most controllable speed wise but it's hot also the hardest angle to get up foiling so we're all a little bit more up to windward and what's interesting is it's probably only New Zealand who are a bit early and they're going on this kind of upwind course to the windward end. And we'll get on to like the issue between Japan and Spain in the next race. Um, but on the face of it, this looks kind of similar, but I'm going to hopefully explain why I think this is actually a little bit different situation to what happened with Spain and Japan. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> New Zealand is well early for this start they're killing time and france is coming with a lot more speed than new zealand so first of all in terms of yes this is fleet late racing you're racing the whole fleet not just one boat but in this moment the big threat to new zealand is france the all the other boats are quite way back and france is coming in with a load of pace so france is the primary threat to new zealand here Okay, so there's a bit of a mistiming between the clock and the actual start line going white. 
But France get locked out here. You know, did New Zealand purposely lock France out? Actually, not really. I think New Zealand were just still killing time. You can see we're down to zero on the timer, but the start line's not open green, uh, white, and it only opens white just then, literally as New Zealand cross. So, I, I, you know, if you're on board France, you can't really take this as New Zealand deliberately locking you out. New Zealand just killing time as best as possible before the start and then putting their bow down literally on the go. And it just happens that that leaves France with no space. It's not something deliberately done. They didn't hang on. They didn't wait later to like take France out. That's just where the boats were. France coming in from high. Again, a favoured tactic of France and Spain is this you know top end of the line start. So <clears throat> I think that's quite a different situation to what we see between Japan and Spain in the next race. Here we can see a very different situation in terms of what's happening for this start. So you can see Spain are sailing on this slow course to the windward end of the line and Japan go in and hook them. Now I think this is a bit of a different situation in terms of how the tactics play out. So it, when we saw New Zealand lock out France, France were the boat that was going much faster than New Zealand. They were the prime threat for New Zealand getting the best start in this race. Here, both Japan and Spain are basically going the same speed. So it's not as if there's a danger of Spain getting a jump on Japan at this point. Basically, Spain is just being held by Japan. Japan just needs to put the bow down when they want. And they're always going to be half a second better off than Spain. You know, at this point, if you're Japan, you're kind of thinking, well, I've got Spain in my pocket and um, I need to now focus on the other boats and getting a good start relative to them because, you know, Spain can't trigger and drop the bow until after I do, so I'm good. Now, let's see this play out and contrast it to what we saw with the France and Kiwi start because I think it's quite different. And I think Phil Robertson has a reason to be a bit annoyed by Japan. So... One second to go. Really, Japan is quite a way back from the line. They should really be dropping the bow at this point to go in. And Spain should drop the bow after them, get a slightly worse start, but everyone's happy. But what happens? Okay, so there's the start. And Japan still isn't dropping the bow. So they've gone from being the boat closest to the line to already um, GBR and USA being ahead of them. We can already see as the start gun goes, the line is clear. France aren't sailing, uh, Japan aren't sailing this high line anymore because they're fearful of being over the line. They've heard the hooter on the boat already and it's kind of three seconds until Japan even start to drop the bow. And at this point, you know, the whole fleet, apart from France who are having a nightmare, but basically the whole fleet has overtaken Japan just for Japan to shut Spain out. I think Freddie Carr says it on the commentary, oh, we've done a Pac-Man there, or maybe it's on the onboard commentary for Japan, one of the other team members said it. But you've got to look at that and say, that's more that's not about japan defending from spain because spain might get the jump on them spain were already like in their pocket on the hip spain could only trigger when japan triggers you know you're racing a whole fleet here really japan's concern was the rest of the fleet the other context to add in this is japan were already through to the final so this start doesn't matter for japan so in some ways you think might be the sportsman-like thing to do to just kind of like, you know, go through the process of going around the course, but also let the other teams fight it out as to who's going to get through to the final. Maybe Nathan's really worried about Spain, thought they were th more of a threat in the final than um, someone else. As it happens, Spain sailed back superbly from this to claim a place in the final, so... You know, if that was Nathan's um, idea was to match race 
fill out. Then he didn't really achieve that either because they bounced back. So you can see, you know, Japan goes through to win this race. So, you know, whatever, who am I to say that this is, you know, a bad start for them? But, well, <clears throat> it is a bad start for them. You know, why would why would Japan do this? And I think they've seen Spain and probably France as well opting for these kind of like easy windward boat starts where they have barged in quite badly. Pitches from Bermuda of Spain barging in at the windward end. Nathan will have seen that. I don't know. What do you think? Part of me thinks this is Nathan Otteridge. This race doesn't matter to him. I think it's partly Nathan Otteridge just stamping a bit of authority, kind of, I don't know, showing up Phil Robertson for kind of electing for the easier tactic of these kind of windward end starts. And maybe also kind of, I don't know, giving Phil a bit of a put down because he is a bit gung-ho at times. You know, there was collision that he had in um, in Sydney, collision with France on the previous um, Cell GP in Bermuda. It really hurts, hurts me. And I can see why Phil Robertson is pretty pissed off about it because there's nothing about those op actions that I can really see is about Japan kind of getting the best start relative to the fleet. Now, there are some, like in fleet racing, there are some limited situations where kind of really hurting one opponent um, is a good idea. Deliberately hurting one of the opponent is a good idea. And that's if, if you're near the end of the race and the only threat to your position is literally one of the boat, then yeah, like put the hurt on that one of the boat. Um, or if you're kind of like against them for the championship, it's the last race of the series, you just got to beat them, then yeah, your focus should be on them. But generally in fleet racing, you're racing the fleet and you're looking for the fastest way around the course. And any harm to you, even if it's slight, kind of, I don't know, is a bit of a poor tactic. And it's something I associate more, I don't know, with kids and kind of lower level races. You know, the type of people go around the course just hoping to call starboard on someone. And that's it. They don't care the result. They just want to you know, get one over on one person at one point of the race. It's kind of a little bit naff and it kind of misses the point of fleet racing. <laughs> and it kind of strikes me as Nathan just kind of doing that. So I can't help but think, I don't think Nathan's the character just to, you know, oh, I just want to get a Port Starboard or a Windward Leward or a shutout in this race. I don't care how I finish. He's not that type of person. So part of me kind of thinks there must be a little bit more toward more behind his actions there in why he wanted particularly to take the opportunity to shut out Spain because it's not really a move that wins you 49er World Championships. Yeah, maybe it's uh, maybe it's Nathan stamping his authority on the event, but I definitely think there's more to it than just Nathan defending his end of the line. Like it kind of went well beyond that. Anyway, um, that's it from, from me on the starting tactics. I'm actually quite enjoying the reaching starts. It's didn't think I'd find myself saying that. I thought of all the aspects, there's a lot I like about Cell GP, some awesome racing. I thought both rounds, even the light wins in Italy this weekend, actually produced really good racing and quite what I thought was quite fair racing as well. I was surprised about that. Um, but yeah, one element that I didn't think I'd ever really come around to enjoying was the reaching starts. But I've got to admit, I'm kind of um, kind of intrigued by how the tactics are playing out. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to as the season kind of goes on or the seasons go on just to see exactly how this plays out and how the rules are implemented and how the teams end up kind of favouring certain set pieces for the starts. Because I think that's... Um, that's all lining up to be quite interesting. So anyway, hope you've uh, hope you've enjoyed this video. I'm going to be speaking to a good friend Rob Gullen again, uh, get his views because I know he's been uh, paying attention to this LGP racing and uh, yeah, he's definitely got some uh, strong opinions on it as you'd imagine. So um, yeah, I'll catch up with him for a chat at the sailing club or something soon. But um, yeah, take care and uh, see you soon.